All right, whenever you are ready to start, we are on. Okay, perfect. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our June 2nd regular meeting of the Arcata City Council. The City Council meeting is being held as tele businesses by masking up in Arcata. Uh, if you wish to make public comment during the meeting, either at the two open public comment periods or for an individual agenda item, there are two ways to do so. So the first is if you're logged on to the Zoom webinar, click on raise your hand on the right hand side of the screen. When it is time for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, the clerk will unmute you and you will have two minutes to comment. The second way is accessing the meeting by phone. Call the number at the bottom of the screen, enter the meeting ID also at the bottom of the screen and press star nine on your phone. This will raise your hand. When it is time for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, the clerk will unmute your phone. You will hear a prompt that will indicate that your phone is unmuted and you will have two minutes to comment. So with that, uh, next on our agenda, we have the flag salute. If you would like to join, uh, please feel free to do so. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Will the city clerk please call the roll? Mayor Pereira. Here. Vice Mayor Watson. Here. Council Member Adkins Salazar. Here. Council Member Goldstein. Here. Council Member Schaefer. Here. All present. Great, thank you. Uh, next under ceremonial matters, uh, we have a proclamation in recognition of Arcata and Six Rivers High School Safe and Sober Graduation Day. Thursday, June 10th, 2021. Whereas safe graduation parties are a nationwide project sponsored by health organizations, businesses, law enforcement agencies, and many other groups. And whereas this year's Arcata High School and Six Rivers Charter High School senior classes, their parents and the community are overwhelmingly in support of intending and providing a safe graduation party. And whereas 5,000 teenagers die and 400,000 are seriously injured in auto accidents each year. Of the 15 to 20 year old drivers who die in car crashes, 23% have blood alcohol levels of 0.08% or higher, enough to be charged with driving under the influence if they were adults. And whereas residents throughout the county have agreed to drive with their lights on during graduation week and the Arcata community has volunteered to keep porch lights on throughout graduation night on Thursday, June 10th, 2021. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Arcata hereby designates Thursday, June 10th, 2021 as Arcata High School and Six Rivers Charter High School Safe and Sober Graduation Day in the City of Arcata and congratulates the graduating class of 2021. So we will make sure that gets to, gets to them and congratulations on making it through a wild senior year. To say the least, you did it. <laughs> Okay, uh, next we have early oral communications. This 15 minute time period is provided for people to address the council on matters that are not on tonight's agenda. At the conclusion of all oral communications, the council may respond to statements. Any request that requires council action will be set by the council for a future agenda or referred to staff. Speakers addressing the council at this time are limited to two minutes and we can take up to seven speakers. So please raise your hand if you are on Zoom uh, or press star nine if you are calling in by phone and wish to make a comment. Uh, do we have any public comment at this time? We are seeing no public comment for this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, next on our agenda, we have the consent calendar. All matters on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the city council and are enacted in one motion. There is no separate discussion of any of these items. If discussion is required, that item is removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. At the end of the reading of the consent calendar, council members or members of the public can request that an item be removed for separate discussion. So I'll go ahead and read through the consent calendar. Item A, approve the minutes of the special city council meeting of May 19th, 2021. B, approve the minutes of the regular city council meeting of May 19th, 2021. C, biweekly report on general warrants. D, adopt resolution number 201-57, 
approving the fiscal year 2021-22 annual report on stormwater drainage maintenance fee for all non-tax exempt parcels and directing that said fee be collected through the property tax rolls for fiscal year 2021-22. E, adopt resolution number 201-56, approving the fiscal year 2021-22 annual report on measure A, special tax for all non-tax exempt parcels and directing that said fee be collected through the property tax rolls for fiscal year 2021-22. F, award bid for the 2021 timber sale of Redwood Logs to RNL Lumber. 1,175 MBF and Douglas fir logs, $550 MBF, Grand fir logs, 420 uh, MBF and Sitka spruce logs, $312 MBF to South Coast Lumber Company and authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. G, approve the purchase of approximately 19,000 linear feet of wiring material award the purchase contract to the lowest bidder and authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. H, approve an amendment to the professional services agreement with Corolla Engineers Inc. for phase one final design of the Arcata wastewater treatment facility upgrade, increase the compensation amount by $176,448, 5.5% for a new total not to exceed $3,371,151 and authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. I approve a dial a ride funding agreement for the city of Arcata for fiscal year 2021-22 in the amount of $79,281 and authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. And last but not least, J adopt resolution number 201-58 approving revised total annual appropriations subject to limitation for fiscal years 2019-20 and 2020-21. Is there any council member that would like to remove an item for separate discussion? Okay, seeing none, is there any member of the public or staff that would like an item to be removed from the consent calendar? No members of the public. Okay. Okay, thank you. We'll all entertain a motion from the council. I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I will call the vote by roll call. Councilmember Atkins Salazar. Aye. Councilmember Goldstein. Aye. Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. Uh, Vice Mayor Watson. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, we are on to old business. Item A, declare a continuation of the local emergency related to the coronavirus pandemic. And may we have a staff report from City Manager Deemer, please. Yeah, thank you. Mayor and Council, um, as we're getting fairly routine uh, at doing, we do need to approve at least once every 40 days the local emergency to make sure that we can continue to respond and or receive uh, reimbursement for certain expenses associated with our response to the coronavirus pandemic. So typically um, we've been re routinely doing these on consent unless there is some change in terms of something that we, we would be enacting. So this has come before you in old business uh, to revisit the extension of uh, allowing us to delay enforcement on a certain provision of uh, what we refer to as uh, ordinance number 1527, which was the city's ordinance around disposable foodware. And that ordinance would require uh, delis, retailers, restaurants that are providing to go food containers uh, to uh, try to encourage people to bring in reusable containers. So while they're still required to use compostable containers based on that ordinance, during the pandemic, we have been waiving the provision that would require uh, delis, restaurants, and retailers to charge a customer 25 cents uh, for that compostable container and or incentivize customers by giving them a 25 cent discount if they brought their own container. Uh, during the pandemic, local food uh, restrictions associated with serving through the pandemic uh, would actually prohibit them from taking reusable containers and filling them with food behind the counter and then transporting back over the counter. So while we do see that regulations are starting to lift, some of the bulk food bins are reopening 
uh, at some of the local stores. Uh, our outreach to uh, restaurants and delis locally have said that they still have not raised a provision to allow reusable containers. So the recommendation, when this came before the council initially, you extended uh, the delay of the enforcement of that provision by six months. So we're coming back to revisit and requesting that we do another six month delay. Uh, and or if the pandemic you know, restrictions are really waived or raised earlier, that we, we would eliminate and start enforcement at that time. But at this point, we do anticipate likely about the six month mark is when they could start to take in uh, reusable containers again that a customer would bring to the deli counter. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll now ask for questions from the council, starting with uh, Vice Mayor Watson. I don't have any questions, thank you. Okay, uh, Councilmember Atkins Salazar. No questions, thank you. Councilmember Goldstein. No question, thank you. Councilmember Schaefer. No questions, thanks. Okay, I don't have any as well. Uh, do we have any members of the public that'd like to comment on this item? There are no members of the public for this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Um, I'll move to uh, continue the local emergency related to the coronavirus pandemic and to um, extend the, the uh, I don't know what we call them, the, the new rules for another six months or until the pandemic ends, whichever comes sooner, whichever comes first. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I'll call the vote by roll call. Vice Mayor Watson. Aye. Councilmember Atkins Salazar. Aye. Councilmember Goldstein. Aye. Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. I vote aye as well. Motion passes. Thank you. And next we have uh, item B, introduce ordinance number 1546, an ordinance of the city council of the city of Arcata, amending zoning regulations pertaining to formula restaurants. And may we have a staff report from community development director, Loya. Yeah, good evening, uh, mayor, vice mayor and council members. Before you tonight is the introduction of ordinance 1546, uh, which does amend the city's formula restaurant ordinance. And uh, we're recommending that you uh, open a public, public hearing and receive any uh, public comment. Uh, introduce Ordinance 1546, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Arcata amending zoning regulations pertaining to formula restaurants, waive reading of the text, and consent to read by title only, and then continue the item to uh, June 16th for adoption. Uh, just a little bit of background uh, for the Council and the community. Uh, on April 21st, Council received a draft zoning interpretation and uh, confirmed the zoning interpretation that currently there's a disconnect between our definitions and the uh, restaurants that we wish to regulate as formula restaurants and initiated a zoning amendment. I brought the draft ordinance to the Planning Commission under Planning Commission Resolution PC 2102, which they adopted on the 25th of May uh, and brought the item to the Economic Development Committee uh, last night uh, both the Planning Commission and the Economic Development Committee uh, recommended ado adopting this ordinance. Um, the Economic Development Committee did have some discussions, as did the Planning Commission, about the limitations in Valley West, recognizing the uh, locational advantage of having formula restaurants near where you have hotels, but also recognizing the impact that that would have on the residents in the area, uh, limiting their food choices. And so those, those discussions did come up. Uh, additionally, at the Economic Development Committee meeting, uh, the committee discussed uh, some potential additional limitations in the Northtown area, uh, specifically on size, number, and location. So if the City Council wants to take that up, uh, we can dig in that into more detail. Um, but I did want to just walk you through the ordinance uh, using a PowerPoint to sort of simplify all the underlying strikeout that's included. Uh, can you confirm for me that you can see the full screen and you don't see the slide advance notes? Okay, perfect. Okay, so, so one of the key uh, issues was around the definition of a formula restaurant. Um, surprisingly, uh, almost no one has a succinct definition of a restaurant. 
uh, which struck me as very odd because none of us gets up to go out to eat for dinner and then ends up at any other place than a restaurant. So clearly we know what they are. Um, but to accomplish the goals of the council, um, I worked on the following key elements in the new definition, effectively just uh, striking out the old definition and adopting a new definition. Um, I made reference uh, for permanent food facility and ready to eat food to the California Food Code. So those are now defined. Um, as it turned out, when I was talking to the um, uh, local Department of Public Health, their food inspectors, um, he said that, you know, under California Food Code, Papa Murphy's pizza actually is ready to eat. Everything on the pizza is edible in the form that they give it to you. So if you wanted to eat one of those raw, you can which was uh, also something interesting I learned while doing this work. Um, but to further define it, really what it boiled down to, to, to capture the kinds of restaurants that we were looking to capture, we had to add to the definition that the food was menu ordered. And uh, again, reinforcing that it's counter table or drive through service or additional types of, of service. And really those two last um, parts of the definition, uh, break apart the categories that would otherwise include many other types of uh, facilities uh, like, you know, liquor stores or, you know, um, uh, you know, anywhere that sells prepared food. And so these two were the ones that are really novel to the definition. So apart from just cleaning up the language, making reference to California food code and adding these, um, these get us down to sort of a smaller subset of things like grocery delis and um, true traditional restaurants. Um, there wasn't a way that I could figure out to you know, further parse out a deli from a restaurant. Um, I think that, you know, again, we, we know it when we see it, but if we wanna regulate these formula restaurants, we have to have a tight definition. And so really this only matters when it comes to the difference between, you know, accessory uses. We had a lot of discussion about, you know, how Safeway Deli, you know, it's signature brand, it's branded the same as Safeway. There are lots of Safeways and so it would qualify as a pattern retail. Um, and so I added a subsection B to the uh, 942.164 code section that essentially says if the primary use is not a restaurant and the accessory is not a franchise, then it's not a formula restaurant, uh, even if it meets all the other criteria for becoming a formula restaurant. And so this portion exempts out things like Safeway Signature Deli. It's clearly got a pattern, you know, you order from a counter um, for all other reasons under food code and under our definition, um, it's considered a restaurant. So that subsection B would exclude Safeway's uh, signature deli, but if the accessory is a franchise or otherwise the entire uh, primary is owned by, you know, a restaurant, the, you know, it's, it qualifies as a restaurant, then it is a formula restaurant. So if either of those criteria are true, then it is a formula restaurant. And this is the case with Chevron's Chester's Chicken. So the primary use is not a restaurant, uh, but the, accessory use is a franchise. And so it's a uh, pattern retail, it's formula restaurant, and it qualifies as such under this new regulation. Um, we did have some, some folks that wanted to know in a little more detail where um, the, you know, where this would be in place. We had some discussion about, you know, which zones it would be excluded from and where it would be, um, you know, allowed. So I just wanted to share with you real quick our zoning map and run through the areas where uh, formula restaurants are allowed currently under code um, with this with this new change where they would be allowed currently. So it's basically it's in the commercial visitor serving and the CVS designation or the commercial general, this orange designation or the uh, yellowish designation, golden rod or whatever color that is. Um, those Zoning districts are the only ones that would allow for uh, formula restaurants uh, as a principally permitted activity. So here in the Valley West and over on the James Road, they'd be allowed. Zooming out, there's also a little bit of uh, commercial general at the corner of Spear and Alliance. 
uh, some of our other neighborhood market areas, uh, like the Murphy's Market, Westwood Market here, uh, those are commercial mixed. So that those don't allow formula restaurants. So anything, you know, it's not just everywhere where there's commercial. Uh, going south a little bit more, we get into the North Town area. The entire North Town business district up to the Central Commercial uh, is allowable. Central Commercial is, uh, it is not allowed, both by the zoning table and by the explicit call out. So all of this red, it's not allowed. Uh, finally, ending our tour uh, going south, there's the Safeway Shopping Center, a little bit of commercial general on, on uh, Samoa. And that is it. So those orange designations. Now there is one caveat to that, and that's in the, uh, let's turn off the standard zoning here for a sec. In the creamery district, uh, and I apologize, some of the lines are, are hidden behind roads, but in the creamery district formed by the border of K Street here, and then this purple line, formula restaurants are actually allowed with a use permit. And so if a formula restaurant wanted to uh, locate there, uh, there would have to be a free formula restaurant, but they would also have to go through a use permit process. Um, and so that's another zone where theoretically under the new regulation, a formula restaurant could uh, locate. Uh, it's important to note though, that despite that, the fact that there are all these other zoning districts uh, where they could locate, um, right now the, you know, the cap uh, set at nine uh, is full. And so the formula restaurants that you know, are existing in the Valley West and in the Safeway Shopping Center, Uniontown Shopping Center, those are, those are basically locations for uh, the near term and uh, foreseeable future. Um, I did just want to touch briefly on the, uh, you know, the couple of discussions that Planning Commission had uh, with respect to the, the total number uh, that's required to qualify as a formula restaurant and also the total number of formula restaurants on the ground. So right now the ordinance reads that if a, re if a restaurant has 11, has more than 11 locations. So you have 12 or more locations and you qualify as a formula restaurant. Um, the rumor is that that ties back to the number of business districts that we had. Um, so a restaurant could theoretically, a local restaurant could locate in every single business district and not be considered a formula restaurant. The reality of the situation is, is that most formula restaurants have thousands of locations and even Westside Pizza has um, tens. I believe they have more than maybe more than 100. And so 12 is artificially low. Um, there was some concern among the Planning Commission in their first review that uh, some of our, our restaurants that do otherwise qualify as pattern, uh, Ramones, Jitterbean, et cetera, um, are doing quite well and have you know several locations uh, and are getting close to that 12 threshold, but they're not quite there yet. And so they wanted to have a conversation around raising the limit. Ultimately, the Planning Commission didn't recommend raising that uh, cap uh, figuring that they could come back to it later uh, if need be. Um, I think that, you know, there may be some, uh, you know, sort of uh, protectionist um, claims that could be made against the city if we all of a sudden decide to raise the cap when Ramones wants one more. And so that's something to consider. Uh, I certainly don't think a, uh, you know, cap on the number of distinct locations uh, that any one restaurant has set at something like 50 uh, would would hurt us now if you wanted to change that. Um, but that's not what, how it currently reads. Uh, and then in regards to the, uh, the total number of uh, restaurants on the ground, um, as we mentioned in the staff report, shortly after we had our April 21 hearing, uh, where we discussed this uh, first, I found out that we actually have another formula restaurant that's in the works. In fact, uh, they're uh, there's a Domino's that's uh, received a building permit to locate in the North Town where the old uh, subway was. And so if all of the permits are issued uh, that are currently in process, we would have 10 and not nine. And so I just wanted to bring that to the council's attention. Um, 
I don't necessarily recommend that you change the cap to 10. Um, you can have you know 10 for a time and then that could whittle down to nine in the future. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and certainly there may be some public members. There have been a couple of folks that have uh, tracked this along the way and they may wanna speak to that. Um, I was gonna do by roll call, but is there, is that okay? Council member Atkins Salazar? Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll start with council member Goldstein. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, David. Um, I, I guess I have a question. If the cap is currently set at nine, then is it possible, like you said, we could have 10 and then it could whittle back down to nine. Um, so they are able to obtain a permit even if they're a 10th restaurant? Yeah, there's there's actually no permit associated with um, with a formula restaurant. There's just a okay. limitation on the total number. And so it it puts us in kind of this odd situation where we have to basically deny a building permit um, okay. in order to, to regulate it, um, which is unfortunate for, you know, the, the person who's wanting to open a formula restaurant, because most people don't come and ask the city, Hey, do you mind if I locate, they just go out and get a lease with someone, they drop the plans and then they come in and submit building plans. By that time they've you know, spent thousands of dollars. And then we tell them, sorry, you can't open. We have this ordinance, but that's neither here nor there. That's just the way that it is. Um, but right now we have the three restaurants that, um, you know, three locations uh, that are currently trying to move through the system. Uh, two of those have moved uh, forward pretty aggressively based on the conversations we had in early April. Um, and so we're in, in sort of this um, odd position. And certainly if the council wants to say, well, no, we're only going to let nine uh, establish and it's the first nine. And if that 10th one, um, you know, isn't opened in time, um, you know, then, you know, then they, you know, that's your tough luck. Um, you know, I'd certainly want to consult with our, our city attorney on what that would look like and what the timing get, you know, into details on what the timing would look like because our ordinance won't be in effect until 30 days after the, uh, in, after it's adopted. And so certainly if they come in and they're issued a building permit, they're operational within that time frame. Um, then they actually comport with our current regulation. Um, and if they, you know, slip over that time frame a little bit, they get a little past that, that outside deadline, but they've been diligently working towards getting their, uh, their building permits. Um, you know, that, that will be a hard conversation to have. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I think my only other question is again, kind of about the cap. I couldn't remember based on our last conversation and kind of where we got to today, um, was it going to be nine for all of the city of Arcata or was it gonna be like a certain number in Valley West, a certain number in North Town and a certain number in the Union Town Shopping Center? That's a good question. So it's currently designed so that there's no more than six in the Valley West area and then a total of nine throughout the city. So. If there were six in the Valley West, there could be three elsewhere in the city. Okay, thank you so much. Those are my questions for now. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Schaefer. Um, thank you so much, David. Uh, that was all very clear and helpful. And to everybody else, I hope my connection's okay. I had a quick change of room, um, so I hope you're hearing me. Uh, but right now, I actually don't think I have any questions. Emily asked the, the question I was thinking of about what the, the provisions for the number in Valley West would be set at. Um, so I don't think I have anything else right now. So thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Atkins Salazar. My question is just, I know that there um, is a business that's been working to locate over in Valley West and are they being counted in, in the 10 restaurants? Yeah, so I've I, the total of 10 includes all of the uh, currently known uh, restaurants that are attempting to open and the ones that are ex existing now. Um, so the, uh, you know, the business that wants to open in Valley West is included in that count of 10. Okay, thank you. Okay, and Vice Mayor Watson. So if we have a restaurant that has 11 locations and then they decide to open 10 more, are they just grandfathered in? How does that work? 
Yeah, that's a, a good question too. Um, so we would we would recognize that businesses existing non-conforming, and in fact, my my recollection I don't have hard data to support this, but my recollection is that's exactly what happened with Westside Pizza when they first opened. I think they had fewer than 12 locations when they first opened in the Safeway Shopping Center, but they've you know been aggressively expanding in the West Coast, and now they have you know I think more than 50 and maybe up to 100, and so if West Side Pizza had opened when it wasn't technically a formula restaurant and then later became a formula restaurant, we would then have, you know, an, an additional formula restaurant location and they we would have to whittle back down. So in the example, you know, more present example of Ramones, Ramones, I believe, has nine locations right now. Um, I'm sorry, I think they have six. Let's say that they get six more and they hit that magic number of 12 elsewhere in the community. Well, the Ramones that is in Wildberries, and you know, is it's totally fine. But if they wanted to open another uh, Ramones somewhere else in town, we would have to tell them, no, I'm sorry, you can't open another Ramones. You're now a Formula restaurant, and we already have nine. Thank you. Which which was part of the reason to maybe have a discussion about bumping that number to you know 50 or even 100. Um, if you wanted to go as high as 100, I'd have to double check on the West Side Pizza. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't have any questions right now. Uh, so let's see if there's any, are there any members of the public that'd like to comment on this item? As a reminder, if you're logged into Zoom, click on raise your hand on the right side of your screen to comment on this item. And if you have called in via phone, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your turn to speak, the clerk will unmute you and invite you to speak. You will have two minutes to, I'm sorry, two minutes to speak. Is there any attendees that wish to comment on this agenda item? No public comment on this item, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, any, I'll, I'll just, Check for any comments or thoughts, uh, starting with Councilmember Goldstein. Um, I don't think I have any extra, any additional questions or comments right now. Um, I, I mean, I would say that I, I'd like to keep the cap, um, or sorry, not the cap, the, like the, the 12, um, or not, not raise it maybe to 50 if we are gonna talk about raising it, that feels like a pretty big leap to me. Um, I'd, I'd like to like hold back a little bit um, with, with that number if that is a discussion we're gonna enter into. Um, and then, yeah, other than that, I mean, the cap of nine makes sense to me. I think that we often hear that we're really proud of our local restaurants um, and so I think continuing to make sure that they have room to grow and um, we can highlight those restaurants is important. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Schaefer. Yeah, um, Councilmember Watson's question kind of raised a, another one in my mind. And I guess if we are kind of entering into this discussion about that, that number of 12, but um, I mean, would there be a way or is it getting a little too into the weeds to add perhaps like a provision about like if this is a local, you know, Humboldt County founded business that it could be exempt then from that, you know, increasing over 12, for example, you know, I think of things, yeah, like Ramones, Jitterbean, if they, you know, I would be proud of Jitterbean if they became a, you know, national corporation um, and wouldn't want to, you know, hinder them from being in the community that they started in, but, you know, it would go directly against that idea of, you know, of, you know, it has now become a formula restaurant. So, I mean, is there a way to have a provision like that or does that get too, you know, it, I don't, it's hard to deal with, I guess. <laughs> I, I want to, um, you know, invite our city attorney to weigh in on that, but I think that, um, you know, that kind of blatantly protectionist uh, policy is probably not likely to stand legal challenge. I think that's right. And that, that is why um, the ordinance is crafted the way it is, as it, it was originally drafted with the help of the um, 
Economic Development Committee's predecessor committee, and they they wrestled with that legal issue um, and came up with a way to, I think, sort of uh, thread the needle through protectionist ordinances and supporting local businesses. Okay, thank you. That makes a lot of sense, so thanks. Okay, uh, let's see, any comments from Councilmember Brack and Salazar? Um, I do think that we should entertain that discussion this evening, just so that if, you know, one of our local businesses does grow and push that, then we don't run into, you know, legal issues trying to fit them in or also having to deny them. So I think if, you know, that we should probably have that discussion tonight as to what the number should be. And then I just wanted to, um, to voice my opinion, because I'm not sure where everybody else stands, but um, even though we've got a, an extra 10th restaurant possibly coming in, I feel like it's important, <clears throat> excuse me, that we move forward and, and let them come in because they've already been in the process and we're now changing the rules while they're in the middle of the process. And I just think that that would be um, not the best business practice if we just you know change the rules midstream and they're already invested in it so i just wanted to voice that as well okay thank you uh vice mayor watson um <clears throat> you know i think i'd be fine with just going with the planning commission's recommendation of leaving the the number at 11 to what qualifies as a formula restaurant uh it doesn't sound like we're going to have any local restaurants anytime soon pushing up on that number I think we could take it as a case by case basis if we if we run into that um, and make a decision then if we want to add them. Um, I mean, it's you know there already it already be an existing location. It's not like we're bringing it like a whole new one into the city. Um, so if we you know expanded, I don't know. Yeah, I think that would be okay. And um, and yeah, and I kind of agree with Council Member uh, Atkins Salazar. Um, and I think the the businesses that already have their their uh, their plans and progress and are working with the city to, to open up and I, so I, and I think we can say what the business is in Valley West, right? No, we can't. I don't know if that's public information. Um, okay. I don't know that they've submitted a building permit. All right. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts on it. Okay. Um, yeah, let me just share a few thoughts I have. I think one actually, I think part of what's made this discussion difficult for me is that I think no, even knowing who it is, I feel like it's like it, to me it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter what the business is um, in terms of this discussion. So I actually appreciate that that's not being brought into the discussion because I I, I think at a certain point from a policymaking perspective, it's not relevant to to our decision that we're making tonight. Um, you know I. In terms of in increasing the number of locations that would then you know trigger what's a formula restaurant or not, I'm on, I'm on the fence about that. Um, you know, I, I think 12 is the you know it's a it's a conser conservative number, um, obviously. Um, but I feel like I would need more information about what are businesses that are in that range of 12 to 50, like how like you know, and it really. It, I mean, I guess at that point, if you're getting close to 50. I mean, that's a form that's a formula restaurant like that's, you know, like so for me, I, I feel like where where is that line? I, I, I don't know. Um, and then in terms of increasing the cap, um, I guess I have a, you know, a, a different perspective. Uh, you know, I appreciate, you know, Councilman Brack and Salazar, your point and Vice Mayor Watson, your point. And I guess there's also just a part of me that's like, I think of all the projects that have come before us as a council where people have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars into uh, you know, a business, a housing project, whatever it may be, and it didn't work out. And um, for, for a variety of reasons, you know, the community didn't want it or the council voted a different way, whatever it is. And so, I, I mean, there is a part of me that feels for any business that, you know, wants to wants to come in and it doesn't pan out. But I, I don't think that's a unique thing. I think there are various barriers that, you know, in, interfere with um, something coming to fruition. And I think um, given that we have had a policy like this um, on the books for quite some time, um, you know, I don't think it's a total 
shocker that we're, you know, look, looking at this, this policy and making sure that it, we're clarifying the language. So I, I don't know how others feel about that, but that's, that's kind of where I'm, I'm landing on it. Um, and let's see. And yeah, I, I do support keeping the caps um, in terms of the, the zones. Um, I think maintaining some protections and, you know, I think it was helpful that, thank you, David, for doing that overview of like, where are the commercial zones where it, it is possible. And I think for me, that just reinforced the importance of having those caps um, because we could definitely see a uh, disproportionate uh, presence of formula restaurants in one, you know, commercial area versus another, um, one neighborhood versus another given their current zoning. So um, those are just kind of where, where I'm landing on this. So I'll, I'll entertain a motion uh, from, from the council Don't all jump in. <laughs> I, have a, I, well, I just have a question because we've talked about so many things. So if we, um, you know, if we make a recommendation to introduce ordinance 1546, does that, that means that we keep, you know, keep it at 12. That also means that, that, that the 10th person could possibly come in or no? If the, uh, <clears throat> I, I would like separate direction on that. If the 10th person um, is in process when the ordinance goes into effect, um, you know, and, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where the threshold is for having, you know, uh, you know, cross that, that line that we would then say, well, you know, you, you now are existing non-conforming because we have this new regulation. Certainly if their doors were open or if they had received a certificate of, certificate of occupancy, um, then, uh, you know, then, then they would be existing non-conforming at the time the, the regulation goes into place. Um, we're in a little bit more of a, uh, you know, we have to dive into the, the discussion a little bit more detail, I think, if we want to you know, cut off at nine, and there may be some additional uh, discussion about uh, when to have the effective date of the ordinance if we want to allow the tenth one in. And so there's there's a little bit of nuance in there that that I think, you know, maybe a straw poll on allowing the tenth or not is is necessary. And just a reminder, you don't have to raise the cap to ten. It would just be the allowance of this tenth one to come in during the rulemaking process. The minute that any of the formula restaurants then closed in Arcata, you would be back down to the nine cap. There would not be an open slot at that point. The way that it's written tonight, you would keep the cap at 10 or at nine. Sorry, <laughs> that's the worst thing to say. You would keep the cap at nine for a period of time. You would have a 10. Just to clarify, it's 11, right? What a formula restaurant is? There, yeah, there's two, there's two numbers and it's unfortunate because it's a little confusing. In order to be qualified as a formula restaurant, you have to have 12 locations or more. We have a limitation of a total number of nine formula restaurants of any type within the city. So there's two, two, two numbers to keep track of. Okay. I'm just looking at the staff report on page 267 and it says the number 11 in the second paragraph. Yeah, so this is talking about the uh, total number of locations of a given pattern restaurant. Right, so but you just said so it's 12? You can have, the, the way that the ordinance is written, you can have 11 and still not be a formula okay. restaurant. And then if you go to 12, then you are a formula okay. restaurant. Um, I'm wondering actually um, if city attorney Diamond could maybe give some guidance to us about, you know, David, where you're seeking some direction on, you know, this 10th location based on where they're at in the process. Um, I think it would just be helpful to have um, your input in, in that discussion. Yes, um, I think that David is right. It's a little gray area. Um, I think the practice within the city is to honor an application process from when the application is first deemed complete and received as a complete application. And so I think he's trying to be consistent with that practice, meaning that if these applications now in the interim are deemed complete, then they would be allowed to um, come slide in under the old existing rules. 
Um, and, and I think he's right that it's gray area. There's some very clear statutes that apply to when uh, uh, developers' rights vest in certain types of permits, um, but, but we don't have those applicable here. So I, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that David is using um, ongoing practices for what the city normally does. And I'm sorry, David, to be trying to construe um, what you're no, that's, that's exactly right. But I, you know, and I certainly think that I, I don't know for a fact that all of the businesses have applications in for building permits for their tenant improvements. Um, if this ordinance were adopted today, um, and uh, you know the council wanted us to continue that that sort of policy of um, you know counting complete applications as being you know in in the hopper basically and, and allowed to open uh, would give these businesses basically a 45 day clock to get their their applications in um, you know if the council wanted to go beyond that and say well we, we want to honor these 10 regardless of when this thing you know goes into effect we'd have to probably you know, get a little more nuanced and so you know i think hearing hearing what the council is interested in doing if the majority of the council is interested in allowing these 10 businesses regardless of what you know um you know our new ordinance says we might uh you know work on crafting some language if the council feels like well when the ordinance is in effect we're we're sticking to nine um that'll that'll basically set the timer for these these businesses to you know, make sure that they've got complete applications into us by the next 45 days. And if the council feels like, well, no, we really want to be, you know, very strict and set a policy that we're only accepting nine one way or the other, um, unless these businesses have their doors open, you know, open for business, they've received a, a, a you know, certificate of, a, of compliance, or I'm sorry, uh, notice of completion for their, their building permit. Um, you know that that would be on sort of the other extreme so kind of fit, figuring out where the council wants to land um you know with this policy discussion i think helps us identify the, the best course for adoption of the ordinance and if i could also add um from the legal side of this if the uh concern is that there's going to be a flood of these kinds of um new formula restaurants jumping in before the uh, addition of the, uh, the the change before it becomes effective the council's option is to adopt an interim zoning ordinance which then goes into effect you have to go through a noticing process a 15-day noticing process but that would go into effect and, and act like a moratorium immediately and it would prevent any changes any new um, formula restaurants from coming in in into existence and then getting grandfathered. So that that's one of the mechanisms that's used to offset this kind of rush to sneak in before the rules change. Um, but I I think that given that there's a lead in time to get to an interim ordinance, and I think that staff decided it, it wasn't worth it in this situation because we he, I think David was so close to having the complete ordinance ready for the council's. Uh, consideration. Council Member, um, I guess I hadn't thought about um, that aspect of a rush, you know, possibly people trying to, to get in while there was a loophole, but I, I am still, you know, would like to, is there a way that we can, if the, you know, if the council decides to, <clears throat> to include the people that have already been in contact with the city, because that's my concern. I know that um, the, I the, believe the people that are wanting in right now have been in contact, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, with with our city and have been talking and moving in a forward motion because it seemed like it was allowable. Um, I feel like we should honor that, um, but not necessarily people just trying to jump in because we're changing it. Um, two of the applicants uh, were definitely in process with the city, and those were the two that came, you know, that we talked about at the meeting in April. And based on the action that the council took that night, uh, the zoning administrator's decision went into place and basically supported the movement of those two businesses. Subsequent to that meeting, we heard from the third business. So this is a, a business uh, owner, a property owner who had a formula restaurant on that site where the Subway sandwich was and was in the process in his mind of just transitioning that to Domino's, figuring that he still had the slot for the formula restaurant there. 
Uh, and so, you know, those are the three that are in question here. And Domino's, I know for a fact, has a building permit in. So even though we didn't know about them when we were having the discussion on the 21st of April, they theoretically could be the first ones to have their doors open. So my, my, my opinion is that we crafted it in a way so that the people, these three businesses that have already been in contact are able to continue through the process. Um, and then, you know, but that we don't leave room for others to jump in while we're in transition, if that's possible. I'll make a motion to introduce ordinance number 1546 and ordinance of the city council, the city of Arcata, amending zoning regulations pertaining to formula restaurants, waive reading of the text and consent to read by title only. A second. And can you please add to that to uh, continue the meeting to continue the item to June 16th for adoption? I'm sorry, that wasn't in the written. That's right. Uh, and to continue the item until June 16th for adoption. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And so just to clarify, so this is for this introducing this ordinance and then we still would need to discuss then the, the piece, the, the gray area piece that we've been talking about. So I just want to, just for the public's clarity and the council's clarity that we're having two separate. What's the gray area piece? About the in-process applications, because I think our ordinance doesn't speak to. I think it does. The way I read it, it, it I think it covers that. On the on page, packet page 268, um, the last paragraph. Um, this is the last paragraph. Yeah, it says formula restaurants, you know, the three, which is all we've been talking about, open would be eight total. On the effective date, Papa Murphy's and Chester's chickens will then be added to the total resulting in 10. I guess I, I, maybe I'm misunderstanding what staff is requesting of us, but it sounds like given that there's new applicants. I think, I think the, um, the distinction is that if any of those applicants don't have a building permit in process at the time this becomes effective, you know, and then falling back on our, our policy, you know, our typical policy, which is, you know, if you have an application in process, you have a complete application and then the policy changes will, you know, honor that application. So if the ordinance is, is adopted right now, the way that it stands, we, that's how we would process this. So the the three businesses effectively have 45 days to get us a complete application. Once it becomes effective, if they come in on the 46th day with an, an application, we'd say, I'm sorry, this ordinance is in effect and we only have nine spots and they're not available for you. Um, if the council wants to give additional direction about you know, honoring that regardless of you know, the implementation of this ordinance, then, you know, we'd need to get a, a little bit more nuanced than what's in the current ordinance. But if everyone's comfortable saying, look, you know, you've got 45 days, you're on notice now, we're adopting this new regulation, get your building permits in. Uh, we essentially, we know that there are these three that have been working on it to, you know, some, you know, in some way, shape or form. Um, I doubt that anybody else is going to be able to get an application in, in, in that 45 day period. Uh, so I, I don't think that's an issue. Um, so I guess that's that's the only gray area. You know, we I would I would recommend that we somehow you know either honor or notify these people that that it's not going to be honored after you know the, the ordinance becomes effective, and just give them a real clear signal that that's how we're going to implement it. And in the unlikely event that another application does try to get in, I mean that's when we would jump into action and bring you either via a regular council meeting or an emergency meeting, you know, a special meeting to talk about if you want to put a moratorium in to, you know, the, you have a backstop and a provision to stop that. So we'll keep that in mind based on the discussion tonight. Yeah, I, I guess I just want to express a, a concern just thinking about our current, you know, our cap has been for well over a decade, nine, and basically without any additional protective measure, this be a, like a, you know, a third of an increase in 
um, in a very short amount of time. And I just, that, that just doesn't sit well with me. I mean, I, I get it that there's folks that have put their applications in and I, I feel like it's a, you know, it's just kind of a confluence of multiple people expressing an interest at the same time. And I feel like that's gonna make a big impact um, just because that happened right now. That Well, two of them are already existing businesses like the Chester Chicken and the Subway, they're just moving. So they're not really new. Um, and there's just two new ones, which would be Domino's and then the one in Valley West. Yeah, but I, I guess what I'm saying is there's the Domino's and then there's another one that's, you know, that we're not talking about. That's not public knowledge, but I guess I just have a, a, a concern about the implications of that. Can we vote? Absolutely. I just have a right to speak my piece on it. <laughs> um, are there any other uh, thoughts or comments? I have a question. So what, what constitutes, and to keep going, but what constitutes a completed application? Um, and, you know, have these three businesses reached that? And you know, d does it seem like they would, or will we be in a situation where, yeah, we probably will be at nine or even at eight and allowing, you know, maybe one to come after this ordinance goes through. Um, Nature, do, do you want to take what, uh, what constitutes a complete building permit application? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> oh, no, no, no worries. Uh, no, it's okay. And I can repeat, Nitra, if you want me to. I mean, just basically, you know, it says we need to have a completed application for it to be counted. Um, so, I mean, what constitutes that? And would these businesses even theoretically, especially the one that is, you know, uh, going to go into Valley West and has a little bit more to do, would that theoretically even happen in this time period? to constitute an application are complete you know we need to have a application filled out by an applicant which has all the information filled out in the forms and we have a checklist that what they need to submit with the um, application for example for in this case i'm not sure who the person or the business is but they have to submit three sets of plans and once we review that and we take the fee uh, then we will say it's complete if it's not complete we may not Take the fee from them because it's not complete application so the moment we take the fees in i would say it's a complete application okay thank you that, i mean i don't know for for me that clears up a little bit and makes me i don't know feel almost more comfortable with this kind of i guess cutthroat approach of you know saying okay you got 45 days especially for a business that is planning on building something and has a little bit more you know, a distance to go, it, it might seem to them, okay, we can't get this done in 45 days. This might not be the place, you know, we already knew that this community had an ordinance similar to this. Maybe this isn't the community that we want to put this in, you know, so that's kind of where I'm standing on that as well. Yeah, I just want to say that like, I, I feel very on the fence about this because I really see, um, you know, com you know, compassion for for people that have started the process. But I I do agree with Mayor Prayer that I I have I have some reservations and concerns that we are, you know, slowly one you know then maybe you know it's another one and that's just not what we really want in Arcata I think and so I'm I'm feeling really torn. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted, I guess I just wanted to voice that I am feeling really torn right now. Um, but that, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, I, I don't want this to get out of hand by accident, just because we're trying to be compassionate to, to one business, I guess. Okay, any other questions or comments? Okay, well, I will uh, call the vote by roll. Uh, Councilmember Goldstein. 
That's just cruel to make me vote. I know. I I, I keep it consistent with the with the items. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, I, I'll vote I. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta keep it consistent. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. Okay, Councilmember Atkins Salazar. Aye. Vice Mayor Watson. Aye. Okay, and I vote I as well. And I really appreciate us taking the time to talk this through. I think it, you know, we didn't have any members of the public to speak on this item, um, but I do know that we've received communications from folks that express that this policy that we've had in Arcata is really a landmark policy and sets Arcata apart. And so I think the deliberations that we're having here, are, I think, are incredibly important. So I appreciate everyone taking the time and being patient in that conversation because um, it is an important part of our community. Uh, so the motion passes and thank you and we'll we'll see where it lands. Uh, okay. Uh, next we have new business. Uh, appoint one new member to the Transportation Safety Committee for a term expiring March 31st, 2024. Uh, let's see, do we have a recommendation to appoint a member to the Transportation Safety Committee or any questions from the council? Is there any discussion that we'd like to have or a motion? Councilmember Schaefer. Go yeah, ahead. I move that we appoint Misael Ramos to the Transportation Safety Committee. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I, I, first of all, any, uh, any members of the public that would like to comment on this item before we take a vote? Checking for public comment and there is no public comment on this item. Okay. Thank you. So I will call the vote by roll call. Uh, Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. Councilmember Atkins Salazar. Aye. Councilmember Goldstein. Aye. Vice Mayor Watson. Aye. I vote aye as well. Congratulations, Misael. Really, really grateful um, to both you and Dr. Ring for um, for stepping up and offering uh, to serve and definitely hope you'll you'll stay uh, connected uh, Dr. Ring um, and, and being involved in our in our work. So motion passes. Uh, next, uh, we have an update on homelessness services working group and current projects. Uh, may I have a staff report from city manager Deemer? Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I will try to be brief, but this tonight's agenda item really comes at the request of the Council after I know several of you have had conversations with community members expressing concerns regarding sort of the increase um, that we're seeing in part because of the COVID pandemic of unsheltered individuals around the business districts in the city. Uh, tonight's update is intended to review some of the community work to date, the work of the uh, Homelessness Services Working Group partnership that the city uh, holds monthly meetings with and to really to generate discussions and ideas about additional services or solutions that that group and our community and our partners could work on together. Uh, so I'm just going to go through sort of a quick review uh, of sort of the recent efforts of the Homeless Services Working Group. This group has been established for a couple of years now and the group has had some some good success in projects such as establishing mobile medical services both in the downtown area and the Valley West neighborhood securing grants to hire the mobile intervention services team members that we have, the mental health clinicians that are now working uh, side by side uh, in the police department, uh, rehabilitation and construction of several units. So support for the Arcata Gardens, affordable housing, rehabilitation, and the 44 units that will be coming online this year, the Sorrell Place being built in the downtown region. Uh, securing tenant-based rental assistance. This is a program that we offered for a couple of years. Uh, we lost funding for it. We've uh, now secured funding and that will be starting back this fall. There'll be more on that in the upcoming agendas of the council. Establishing mobile showers uh, and providing food and warming provisions during the PG&E power shutdowns. Uh, and then during the pandemic, uh, we focused on two primary sheltering options. Uh, the first has been 25 hotel rooms that were secured and then supported with meals and services. Uh, those uh, hotels have been operational for over a year now, and that program is slated to end June 30th uh, at the end of this month. And so I'll talk about that a little bit later in some potential short-term goals. 
And then we did have a period of time where we were able to receive state funding to provide alternative shelter uh, through two parking lot shelter locations. And those shelter sites operated in total for about 130 days. We had 95 different individual participants that stayed for a total of what we call bed nights uh, of 3,576 bed nights. So the average length of stay per uh, participant in that program was about 38 days. 14 people were transferred into sort of brick and mortar shelters. Uh, six of them were permanently housed. Uh, all of the individuals that came to those sites were known to be uh, homeless here in the Arcata area and 41 of them really were known to be chronically homeless here in Arcata. And in that period, again, of just about four and a half months, um, served over 10,000 meals uh, through those two sites. So the program uh, at that alternative shelter provided you know, a safe place. Uh, we had tents and cots that were provided through the county uh, and then funding that also came through the county that supported meals, water, showers, laundry vouchers, uh, bathrooms and hand washing stations on site, cell phone charging, uh, and then wraparound case management as we could start to build uh, through that period of time while we had funding. Uh, the group also has several upcoming projects that are in the works. Uh, several of these the council has already talked about, so I won't go into great detail, uh, but one of the largest is the uh, community development block grants, the what we call CV two and three, rounds two and three for COVID funding. And that grant will uh, provide money to do uh, staffing to do intake at the one stop, which is down near the transit annex. And this helps homeless individuals locate services, including housing in the region. Outreach to encampments and to sort of meet people where they are and provide services uh, in the community while also maintaining kind of safe and healthy environments in those camps and helping to do uh, trash removal um, <clears throat> and clothing and bedding exchange. Modifications to the annex site. So the primary site that Arcata House Partnership uh, works out of uh, to provide better COVID safety for both staff and clients and to do some significant upgrades that they need to be able to uh, better provide food services. Uh, and then purchase of two needle disposal kiosks, kiosks and to fund regular disposal servicing for them. And we expect those funds to be available in late summer and we'll be rolling out some of those, you know, those programs as soon as we receive uh, notification and approval from the state to do so. Uh, the council has in our goal setting, and this will come before you for final adoption in your budget, but your number one goal uh, this year was to work on a two to three, uh, two to three year homeless reduction strategy and a framework for identifying some initial priority benchmarks. And part of that was to support our Cata House Partnership in securing funding for hotel conversion uh, to permanent supportive housing. Uh, utilizing Project Home Key, and that is in one of our long-term goals of the working group, to identify an ongoing funding stream, such as a sales tax or parcel tax, increased TOT or vacation rental tax, cannabis tax. There's a lot of different ways it could be viewed, uh, but something that we would consider as a ballot measure, uh, ballot initiative for voters to consider in 2022 is ongoing funding uh, to support services. Identifying a location and operational funding for a day center, and supporting uh, the collaborative uh, that we have uh, existing, providing additional support through Arcata House Partnership. Uh, and then long-term, we had talked about developing more cooperative housing models here in Arcata. So the Homeless and Services Working Group has identified a, a few short-term potentials and then some mid-term and some long-term. I can stop for just a minute to make sure there aren't any questions before I review the short, mid and long-term. Uh, see any questions just raise your hand if so okay Go ahead. Um, so on the short term um, side we have really been looking at what would it take to do uh, low barrier shelters either just individual night shelters or more long-term low barrier shelters similar to the experience that we were able to fund in the emergency shelters in the parking lot um, the program would require uh, identification of a site installation of temporary shelter units securing fencing support facilities uh, our major challenge on low barrier shelter right now is that uh, there is some changes in the building code that actually go into effect on July 1st of this year. 
that are requiring these types of shelters to meet additional health and safety and accessibility codes. So we are working through what that looks like and what that might potentially bring to bear in terms of the cost of setting up that type of low barrier shelter. Uh, we are also talking through um, sort of the logistics of a business district engagement program. So this would fund outreach workers to provide uh, morning outreach to individuals that are currently sheltering in doorways and are in close proximity to our local business districts. This would be in Valley West, Northtown, Creamery District, Marsh District, and the Plaza. And it would assist with um, cleanup from nightly sleeping and connect individuals with services. Uh, we have identified a, a funding source for this and at this point are working on the application to receive that funding and try to initiate that program. Um, we also secured a grant uh, this year to do natural resource property outreach specific to Carlson Park. So we're waiting uh, for that grant agreement. We've submitted everything that we need to on our end and we're just waiting for the green light. Uh, we have been uh, in contact with New Directions, which is operated by John Shelter's group. Uh, to do that site cleanup and engagement and service provision for individuals in the Carlson Park area. Uh, John Shelter's group did help maintain that site when it was under Caltrans ownership and is very familiar uh, with the site and the natural resources provisions on um, that are required um, from Caltrans on the site as well. Um, talked earlier about the tenant-based ba tenant rental assistance. So we have secured a million dollars in funds uh, outreach to sign people up for that program will begin once those contracts are finalized, but we do anticipate that by the end of summer. Uh, and then you're all very familiar with the mobile intervention services team. So really that was just initiated in March of 2021. Uh, so we're just starting to understand, you know, what the potentials are for that program. And in another, you know, three to six months, I think we'll have a much better sense of what type of long-term funding uh, that program, how, how large we would want to ramp that up, what are the critical hours that it operates, the critical numbers that it operates in, and be able to provide uh, a recommendation to the council. Uh, and then in a short-term possibility, uh, we are seeing that some of the funding coming out kind of post, you know, and this stage of COVID um, does also allow the hotel shelter to pay for hotel vouchers. And so I do think in the short-term potential, this group will start to look at some alternatives to potentially retain the hotel sheltering program that we have right now. Uh, in terms of midterm potentials, the county is actively working on uh, releasing a request for information for operators to uh, actually operate low barrier shelters. So one of um, the barriers that we have uh, sort of run into on low barrier shelters is to find uh, operational support and expertise. Arcata House Partnership, as we have talked about, is just an absolute tremendous partner. We are so fortunate to have them operated and headquartered here in Arcata. Their services are in large demand throughout the county. Um, and at some point, they're just absolutely working way beyond their capacity now. And we need to be able to find some additional support uh, to, to operate programs that help uh, support those experiencing homelessness right now. Uh, and so this, so the county is looking at doing a request for information. The idea is that we could establish low barrier shelters that do meet the new building guidelines that would be standardized throughout Humboldt County and then operated, you know, in coordination with each other and in coordination with Department of Health and Human Services. Um, second midterm potential uh, is additional housing vouchers. So the local housing authority is gearing up to go after 182 new emergency housing vouchers. So that's a big number for our community. Uh, we're working right now with the uh, local partnership, the Continuum of Care, Arcata House Partnership to try to secure as many of those vouchers as we can receive and we think we can identify housing for. Uh, but we have had some really creative ways that we think we can utilize those vouchers. And those are permanent. That is permanent supportive housing money uh, for those individuals here in our community. And then long term, I touched on quickly already is what's called Project Home Key. The governor's budget proposal includes 1.75 billion one time funding for Project Home Key. Uh, this is expected to fund further hotel conversions. You did have a round one uh, of this money and to provide up to five years of support uh, funding for these operations. So the working group right now is discussing the development of a project to be really fund ready 
uh, once that source of monies is released and those notice of information go out and we can put in an application. So, um, you know, I think we all recognize that there is a growing need. There are a lot of new projects under development trying to help meet some of that need. Uh, I think that our tenant based rental assistance program in part might help many individuals as we come out of COVID that would be facing evictions be able to stay housed. Uh, but we recognize that uh, we're going to have to continue to communicate and to work with our community to try to find additional solutions as we can. So I will stop there and um, open up for your discussions and we're all here to try to help answer questions and brainstorm. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, we'll start with questions from the council starting with Vice Mayor Watson. Uh, I don't have any questions. Um, I'll have some comments later. later. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Schaefer. Yeah, same. I don't have any questions. That was very a great thorough review. I have a couple comments when we get to commenting, but no questions. Okay, and Council Member Atkins Salazar. The same. I have comments, but no questions. Okay, and Council Member Goldstein. I have a, I guess it's a question. Um, so I was just wondering, and I probably should know this because I am part of the working group. Um, has there or will there be some type of um, like needs assessment or informally or more formally um, with houseless individuals to see what services they're actually going to utilize or want want and need um because i think that's one of the trickiest things when talking about some of these things they sound really great but if nobody's going to utilize them because they're not what they really want then you have a service and nobody using it so i was just wondering if there's a plan for that or if that's happened in the past there have been a couple of surveys. We obviously do the point in time count um, every year. Um, we find that we think that that's probably grossly underestimates the number of individuals uh, without shelter and that given night anyway in Arcata. Um, Arcata House Partnership has done a lot of outreach and they have done a lot of sort of survey work with, uh, with their um, both their street outreach and then people coming in requesting services. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if I've seen, and, and David, jump in if you have, where we have formalized that in any kind of a report. So I think that would be a great discussion to have uh, with the working group and bring back recommendations from that. I think Darlene might have some, you know, have some data that we could start to populate that with, and we could look at the gaps and see what other kind of survey work we would like to do. It's a great idea. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, um, I guess a question I have, maybe it's a bit of a leading <laughs> leading question. Um, given that it is one of our priorities um, to look at a 2022 you know, ballot measure for a funding mechanism to support homelessness services and affordable housing in our data, um, and we're in 2021 right now, um, I, you know, that's, it's gonna sneak up on us. Basically, we would need a, I mean, right, it would be by next year, next summer, that we would need to vote to put something on the ballot. So given that time frame, um, you know, when could we get um, some recommendations of, I think from the work from the working group, I think it would be really helpful to get an estimation of what would be a, a reasonable uh, ongoing funding source like amount you know is it in a bit evidence-based like right looking at the operations and you know looking at all these different funding opportunities that we're going to get so you know obviously those aren't long-term sustainable but and obviously we can't you know with one ballot measure fund ending all of homelessness in Arcata alone I think you know we <laughs> like that that would probably cost I mean it would cost a lot of money like I mean I think for, um, I appreciate everything that's been talked about um, in terms of what's been done, but it, it costs a lot of money. It's it's very um, money intensive, I think, to to do this work. Um, so that's why I think we need a funding source and what, you know, what could we expect to be a reasonable timeline for the working group to come back 
to the council and and give some recommendations of you know here here's the different amounts of money like this is what two hundred fifty thousand dollars would help us get this is what half a million dollars would help us get and I think contextualizing that would be really helpful for this council to be able to then identify what are the revenue generators that would help meet you know meet those needs so yeah that was a long-winded leading question <laughs> do we have an idea of how long that would take probably for the working group to give us that estimate i mean i don't have an answer but thank you for asking that i think it's an important question um, i think we could report back i think we've got two great topics for our next meeting so far <laughs> And I think they would very much like to do that work together. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thanks for entertaining my my leading question. Um, let's see. Uh, do we have any members of the public that would like to comment on this item? It does not look like we have any members of the public to comment on this particular item. Okay, well, let's go back through because um, it sounds like people were holding back uh, comments. Uh, Vice Mayor Watson. Yeah, you know, I think this is a, it's important for the public to know. We get, you know, we get a lot of, you know, comments, I guess, and complaints really about homelessness all over the city. And um, I feel like a lot of people feel like that we're not doing anything. Um, and uh, I think it's important for the public to know that this problem, it's just to be honest, it's not going away anytime soon. It's a huge problem that the entire state's struggling with. And, um, you know, I can say from my um, conversations with Council Member Goldstein, it's something that we're both really passionate about. And, um, and it is our, you know, I think our top priority for the next year. And uh, we are doing everything we can to work on this. We work on it every day. You know, I know the staff works really hard on it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, those are my comments, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Schaefer. Yeah, um, I really want to reiterate that too, because we, we do get a lot of emails, phone calls, whatever it might be about, you know, the houseless individuals in our community and, you know, what a lot of people see as, you know, a detriment to the community. So let's come together as a community and figure out a way to transform this, which is another reason that I'm definitely very much in support of, you know, creating a long term funding source, uh, whatever, you know, a sales tax. Uh, other sort of property tax, whatever that might be, what we come to, um, because it's really something that the whole community needs to come together and realize, you know, if we want to transform our community and improve it, this is something that, you know, everybody needs to do because you can't just, you know, wave that magic wand and have a billion dollars to build two new homeless shelters and a couple housing units and everything like that, right? It, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of work. Um, and, and just to reiterate that idea that, yeah, you know, we are always, all of us on council and city staff, and especially, I mean, Arcata House Partnership are working constantly. And, you know, to see on this list that Arcata House Partnership is, you know, ready to even take on a, another thing right now with how much that, you know, they are really doing as, you know, a, a, a pinnacle of our community to really help houseless individuals is just, you know, shows, I mean, their dedication and our community's dedication to wanting to try to find solutions. So, I just, you know, I'm very in support of the low barrier night shelter. I think that's going to be really amazing for our community. And I think the work that, you know, Arcata House has done, you know, even with the, the parking lot shelters in the past and the work that they're doing now in Valley West with their new offices there, um, you know, it's, it's all amazing. And so just really, I think all of us were very passionate about this and, you know, really coming together as a council to be behind uh, you know, something that could be transformative, a, a ballot measure that could provide us a source of funding that we could really make a difference in this community. And so I think that's going to be a really important piece, yeah, for us to work on. And, you know, already now starting to think about that and getting something like that in front of us is going to be important. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, and Councilmember Atkins Salazar. My comments are pretty much on, on the same line as the others that have been made, but I do just really appreciate the thorough report <clears throat> because, you know, we only sit on so many committees and don't know what's happening on them unless we hear from them. And so even though I, you know, have a pretty good idea of what's going on when I 
read my council packet, I learned a lot that we're doing that I was unaware of. And so I think it's really important for us to stay connected and, and for the community to also hear what's what's happening and what is being done because there is a lot being done even more than I realized. And, um, you know, not to put the um, that working group on the hot seat, but I feel like since this is one of our top priorities, it sh you know, it should be on our agenda more often and, you know, just probably a bigger part of our discussions because it is, you know, in the top of what we want to do. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Goldstein. Yeah, I, I fully echo everything that's been said. I think this is an area that we we all care deeply about. Um, and I don't think that's putting us on the hot seat at all. Um, I think that's actually a really good idea. I thought about, I love being part of this working group and I think it's something that um, Vice Mayor Watson and I can talk about doing more often a report out or something um, to make sure that we're keeping you all updated too on since we are the only two that get to be on that group um, at least this year. So um, I think that's actually a great idea. And um, yeah, I mean, this is, we have some really exciting ideas. Um, I am continuously blown away by Arcata House Partnership and just the amazing work they do um, and how tirelessly they work. Um, it's it's just pretty incredible to see that. And I, I think we are very, very lucky that they are, are based in Arcata. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have hope for, for this because of how much energy I know everybody is willing to put in. It's one of those topics that feels really big. And as Vice Mayor Watson said, it's not going away, unfortunately, anytime soon. But I do actually think we have a real chance to make strides forward here. Um, we have some really great plans and a lot of energy behind it. Um, so I'm I'm hopeful for the future. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I have <laughs> um, just yeah, very, very grateful for all the hard work everybody, city staff, everyone is doing on this. Great, thank you. Um, just a, a couple things to note. One, um, our, you know, just thinking about natural places to give updates on, you know, working groups and committee work. Um, you know, at the end of our agenda, when we have council and staff reports, that's typically a time um, where if, if we don't formally have something on the agenda, but you do have an update of, you know, for any of us that are like we're liaisons and or we serve on the different JPAs, just know that that is always an appropriate time to give, give an update uh, to the group. And then if there is something that needs more discussion um, from the council, then at that point we can say, hey, you know, this is something this group is talking about should we put it on the agenda? And that's usually a time that we can, you know, vet something like that and bring back to the council in a, in a more formalized fashion. So just wanted to note that, that that's, a, that's always a good place uh, to give updates um, without it being formally on the agenda, um, if, if that's not happening in advance. And then, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to add, um, just because I think it was a part of the large, <laughs> there was a lot going on in, in those updates. Um, and I, I just, I think given my work on the governor's council on homelessness and looking at things from that statewide lens, just really giving, giving credit to our governor who has been really bold on this because this is not an issue typically politicians want to touch because it's feel it's insurmountable. It feels insurmountable. So like, why would any politician want to touch that issue? Right. Because you want, you want easy wins in politics. And I appreciate um, the the statewide leadership and the local leadership being willing to take this on and say, you know, we, we can do better, even if it feels insurmountable. And specifically the five years of operation funding, like that is huge. I, I think it was like, you know, it was a part of a large report, but like that is huge. And I know that was something that we, you know, really deliberated um, as a, um, on this state council was like, what are the things that would really make a difference? And that was one of the things that we identified was that longer term operational funding. It's just hard when it's like three years. It's just like you can barely get something off the ground and then try and finding sustainable funding at that point. It's just it's too difficult um, to have that quick of a turnaround. So I just really want to show appreciation. <laughs> Not that he's watching this. He's got other things going on. But I think for the public to understand like that there are changes happening at a state level 
that are also positioning us well to address this um, in a ways that we weren't able to before. And the Project Home Key is another great example. So just um, there's a lot of state resources coming down the pipe that are helping us. And I appreciate that we have a council and a community that wants to move forward on this and like leverage that opportunity and that we don't wanna waste it. So just wanted to give that context um, and appreciation for everyone working on this. Um, let's see, uh, I think with that, we can move on um, to item C, review and consider the new projects proposed for the capital improvement program, fiscal year 2021-22. And can we have a staff report from city engineer Cotry? Yes, um, good evening, mayor, vice mayor, <coughs> uh, council members, staff and the members of the public. Uh, the item in front of you is to review and consider new projects for the uh, CIP, I call it capital improvement program for fiscal year 21-22. Our first uh, CIP or capital improvement program was prepared on 2000, in 2010, and that included the projects for 2010 to 2015. Uh, since then, we have been updating five-year CIP annually uh, through a budget process. Each year, based on the city needs, council goals, and available budget, we prepare a list of projects to be added on that five-year CIP. The list is refined during our um, goal setting uh, with the council members. And then it goes to the planning commission to ensure the projects are consistent with our general plan. Um, this year, we have added only three projects to be considered. Um, those three projects are in your staff report as an attachment A. Project number one is upgrading the radio system for the Arcata Police Department. Second one is 30th Street Improvement Project and bridge installation. Uh, third project is purchasing two new electric bus for the transit division or for the transit. Uh, attachment B includes prior projects or prior five year CIP, which was approved through budget process last year. Uh, with addition of these three projects, now we will have 56 projects which will be in progress. Uh, most of the pro projects are in progress. A uh, few of them are on hold because of the budget constraints. A uh, few of them are completed and they will be removed once we finalize the list uh, at the end of this year. So far, I would say uh, from 2015 till 2020, city has invested uh, $25.5 million through CIP program. And in next five, year, five years, we are scheduled to invest 50 plus million dollars through our CIP program. So that's my quick uh, snapshot of the CIP and uh, this, uh, you know, all this project will be incorporated in our budget and it will be coming in future meeting for your approval. So today uh, we'll be taking some public comments and if you have any questions, I'm here to answer the questions. Thank you, City Engineer Katri. I just wanted to clarify since we do have three new council members that um, the item before you tonight is just really to add those three to our list to re-adopt our full project list you're not allocating budget to any of those. That will all be done through the budget. Doesn't mean we're gonna have money for everything on the list, um, but it means that we strive to keep it in our vision, that's all. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. I think that's helpful. Also for the public to know too, what, what, we're, what we're voting on. Uh, let's see, I'll ask for questions from the council, starting with council member Atkins Salazar. I don't have any questions, thank you. Okay, council member Goldstein. Uh, no questions, thank you. Council Member Schaefer. No questions, thank you. Vice Mayor Watson. Yeah, I was just curious, where do the electric buses get charged? Uh, uh, as you know, we don't have enough uh, room in our transit um, area or at the end of 9th and 10th Street. So they will be charged at HTA station where our bus get, gets maintenance. Our bus are stored there overnight anyway. So we will, we will have a charging station there for our electric bus charging. Thanks. Great, thank you. I don't have any questions. Uh, so do you have any members of the public wanting to comment on this item? Checking if we have any members of the public that would like to comment on this item. And it does not appear so. Okay. Uh, I will entertain a motion from the council or any final comments, of course.
I move that we approve the proposed projects for the capital improvement program fiscal year 2021 to 2022. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I'll call the vote by roll. Councilman Brack and Salazar. Aye. Councilmember Goldstein. Aye. Councilmember Schaefer. Aye. Vice Mayor Watson. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next, we have oral and written communications. This time is provided for people to address the council on matters not on tonight's agenda. Please raise your hand if you are on the Zoom webinar or press star nine if you are on a phone line and you would like to make a public comment. Speakers are limited to two minutes. When it is your time for public comment, the clerk will unmute you and invite you to speak. Do we have any folks open to comment? We do not have any public comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we will move on to council and staff reports. Are there any staff updates? I just thought I'd answer the most common question that I'm getting this week, which is yes, the first three weeks of crabs tickets are on sale now. So humblecrabs.org <laughs> and they're going to go fast. So get your tickets. <laughs> you have to pre-order. They will not sell them at the gate. So, and you have to buy your whole pod. So, but it's going to be a really fun season. We're excited to see baseball played in Arcata. Great. That's that's a wonderful update. I think the community appreciates hearing about for sure. Uh, let's see, uh, Councilman Brack and Salazar, any updates from you? Um, yeah, I just have one. I'm the Main Street liaison. And um, since I'm new to this process, I'm not, you know, exactly sure what is to be done or the process moving forward. But I just wanted to make the council aware um, that we're down to two board members on that. So um, they are going forward with the Oyster Festival, which is going to be happening. Um, it's like a, a pre-order and express type of festival and it's moving over to the Creamery District. Um, but there are only two active board members to my knowledge right now. So I don't, I just wanted to make you all aware of that. Thank you. And that's, that's an impressive feat, just be pulling off an event under these conditions in general. So on top of that, wow. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Goldstein. Uh, no, I don't have anything, thank you. Okay, uh, Councilmember Schaefer. Uh, nothing to report and thank you to uh, City Manager Deemer for answering my ever burning crabs question that I've been asking like for the last month, so. <laughs> I've already got my tickets. Okay, and Vice Mayor Watson. No updates, thanks. And yeah, I don't, I don't think I have any updates. Um, yeah, HWMA, Humble Waste Management Authority meeting is next week. So I guess after that, I'll have an update. Um, okay, uh, on to dates of future meetings. Uh, we have our annual budget study session on June 15th, starting at 5.30, and a special meeting for a study session with the Planning Commission and to discuss and adopt the 2021-22 annual budget, Thursday, June 24th, 2021, at 5.30 p.m., both via teleconference. Um, and then lastly, we just need to determine a summer schedule for city council meetings. Uh, Karen, can I just turn over to you to give kind of context of how we typically handle this? Yeah, um, I'd be happy to. So, I mean, the, the council does um, in the summer often take, you know, one um, or in some summers two, you know, meetings uh, that they try to consolidate and, and take one or two meetings off in the summer. But then we've had some summers where we've tried to go straight through. So I have just heard from several of you about times that you might be away from, you know, from the area and wanted to put this on the agenda to see if we wanted to try to stick through the whole summer schedule or if there was a, you know, a particular time that you wanted to try to have a special meeting that you were all gonna be here, or if there was a particular meeting that you wanted to, to cancel because we wouldn't have many people or a quorum here. So, um, I don't know, we had a longstanding practice of the first meeting in August, um, but that really was around a past council schedule. And I haven't heard any of you talk about that week yet. So. <laughs> I can't really recommend that one. Oh, except maybe Sarah. Okay, Sarah's gonna be gone the first week in August. <laughs> um, so I thought we should just have a discussion and we don't have to finalize it tonight either. 
Uh, but just if we wanted to start throwing dates out and talk about it, it would be good. Um, I mean, what if, well, I guess, first of all, is there even an, an interest from the council in entertaining, you know, that, that practice of, you know, consolidating stuff into one special meeting and canceling one of the regularly scheduled meetings? I think foundationally, like, just need to know if there's an interest in that from the council or any opposition to that. Or indifferent. Be, the reason why, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm indifferent. Um, I'm, I am going to miss the, the next, our next council meeting. Um, but I, and I'm unable to zoom in on that, but considering that we can have, I mean, I guess in theory people might like to take a vacation without having to attend work. I get that, but, um, we can, we also do have the option of, of zooming in, which wasn't available in the past, you know, with Brown Act rules. So as long as that's still in place, um, I think I can make everything else work, but I'm, you know, I, I'm indifferent. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty indifferent too, though. I, I have already, you know, I will be gone the first week of August. And if we did take that off, then that would be, you know, convenient for me. But, you know, actually, this, the summer is my less busy time most of the time uh, as a teacher. So I'm, you know, fine either way. I would agree. Um, I'm planning on being away July 7th. In theory, yes, I could zoom in. Will I want to? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, yeah, I'll be in Southern California with family that week. So, um, yeah, that's my only time. I think I'll be away this summer. It sounds like we can all just rotate and like miss, miss a yeah. meeting and then still be okay. Cause it sounds like Stacey's going to miss in June. You're in July. I'm in August. So I think, you know, it seems like it would work out. Yeah, that totally sounds fine to me. Um, Vice Mayor Watson, any thoughts? No. Um, well, I, I guess I guess maybe. <laughs> um, I would just say, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, we can. I mean, we can always if we have an agenda where there's really nothing on it, you can always uh, decide to cancel the meeting too, right? As the mayor. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, we can yeah. we can always assess if it's looking light. And I guess the other consideration, Karen, too, is that if it's looking like staff are also, because that has been a routine, the first meeting in August. So if it does look like staff, like department heads or, you know, whoever are kind of taking time off around the same time, you know, if that's just something that would affect what's going on in agenda, we can also assess from there. And I appreciate that. And I think uh, Vice Mayor Watson brought up a good point that it, in part, we've also canceled because our agendas do tend to be a little bit lighter in the summer. Uh, but that being said, we also, after July 1st, we also tend to have a lot of uh, bid work that's going out. So sometimes we've scheduled a special meeting to make sure we can keep bids moving efficiently and get construction work on the ground happening. So, um, but happy just to play it by ear. It does sound like you're all going to sort of split uh, and we can we can look at the agenda items to make sure that we've got a full quorum, you know, for meetings that have all of our work is significant, but have things that really require all five of you to be there, <laughs> like the budget, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. but appreciate the discussion. Okay, great. So we'll just play it by ear. Uh, so with that, we are adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.